Welcome to the Biohackers Live Show. My name is Teemu Arinant. We continue with Seam Lund. So if you tried to check Kasper van der Merlin just a moment ago, uh, that didn't go live on YouTube. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook and uh, you can follow us also on Seam Lund's YouTube channel. So that's streaming live. Also, we are going live on Instagram on the Biohacker summit instagram live feed uh or not because we don't have wi-fi <laughs> so that's not gonna work out um anyway so can you guys maybe fix can you fix the wi-fi do you know how to fix it you don't okay i'll fix it just a quick quick one to do that <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, my morning routine. Yeah, well, I would say that uh, today was a slightly different morning routine than usual because uh, I'm here. <laughs> so I was traveling from uh, home in Estonia to Helsinki. Uh, but yeah, like most of the things I did were just trying to... Um, kickstart my circadian rhythm and uh, just prepare for the traveling uh, but yeah usually I don't really have like a specific type of morning routine anymore that I do because I feel I don't need it <laughs> or I right. just I just adjust it based on uh, based on the day and uh, based okay. on what I'm going to do like for the rest of the day yeah. that seems to be with a lot of biohackers that we we start first pretty dogmatic about things and we don't compromise in terms of diet or lifestyle or patterns and mm -hmm. that's kind of how we how we also uh, calm down the 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 anxiety inside <laughs> of us the 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 animal inside of us that's kind of uh, distracted all the time with a lot of things so we get into routines and we try to focus on mm. a specific thing like morning routines or work routines and and that's what um what we dive into and as we progress just like taking up any martial art for example First, you imitate the master, and once you're beyond that stage, you start to kind of create your own art. Yeah. And that's when you are wiser in terms of diet. You don't just follow a rigorous diet, but you're thinking, what am I doing today? Okay, yeah. I'm traveling, so I will have a different um, feeding pattern and maybe dietary choices than on a day when I would be exercising or working in front of my computer. Is that right? Yeah, for sure. Like, but I do think like routines and this, let's say disciplines, they're, they're still crucial and you do need to develop them and build them in order to achieve that freedom in the first place. Because if you go like, okay, I'm just gonna not care about anything and I'm gonna be like this, you know, leaf in the wind and uh, don't have any discipline, then you're just kind of lying to yourself and you don't really, you, you wouldn't be able to turn on the discipline when it's needed, so to say. So it's almost like a, it's almost like a, yeah, like a flowing thing that you're, you, you do have the ability to be very strict and very follow the routine, whether that be in regards to a diet or your productivity routines, whatever they may be, but you're at the same time still somewhat able to know, understand the dichotomy in a sense that it's not always best to be very strict. Sometimes it's actually best to be somewhat of a flower and be less strict. Mm, mm. So, so uh, I guess flow state is what we, we many of us try to access is is when we in our day uh, get as much focused uh, time in in the things that we are passionate yeah. about, and when we lose our sense of time. We discussed that with uh, Max Gotzler in our previous. Um, Biker's live show. Uh, we also discussed about intermittent working periods <laughs> through Pomodoro techniques and all of that. Like, do you practice yourself? Like, uh, like I mean, you you have written two pretty <laughs> huge <laughs> books. So, so I'll show it to our 
Instagram live feed. So there's the Metabolic Autophagy book. It's a big book. Check it out on Amazon. And then there's the Metabolic Autophagy cookbook that's just a work in progress, I guess, right now. Is, is it available already? It's already available, yeah. And okay. Cool. It's almost like a sequel to the first one, just yeah. an addition. And you've written like uh, four other books in addition <laughs> to this. And uh, you're, you're, you're also... I mean, many people describe you as the prodigy of biohacking. Um, so, so despite your young age, you achieved a lot. And uh, you're already beyond the stage of being dogmatic about your daily routines <laughs> even. So, yeah. so what's your secret? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think my kind of secret is, again, like these very daily disciplines and habits that I, at the moment I'm just doing automatically and without any like effort. Uh, but in the past, they did require to, you know, this consistency and uh, changing your habits in some certain ways to achieve this level of like productivity, uh, autom automatic productivity in a sense. And what I do is generally I just uh, focus a lot on um, daily uninterrupt un uninterrupted work where mm -hmm. I'm like so solely focused on doing this work related to like content creation or something else uh, that I'm doing. And I think that's where kind of the most of the magic is also coming from. You're not right. being like distracted from different things. You're not, you know, looking at Facebook. You're not uh, mm -hmm. on social media and chatting with someone else. You're actually just completely honed into whatever you're doing. And I feel that's where most of your like creative creativity is also accessed much more easily, uh, just because you're like, just like you enter the flow state. And the the kind of definition or one of the characteristics of flow is this sense loss of a uh, sense of time and loss of sen sense of self so you're almost like completely in a different realm <laughs> in this sense. right so what are the things that you have struggled with in terms of interruptions um well i live like i've i've been very diligent and very careful about how i construct my environment and my surroundings so i live you know at a very peaceful place which is like a small island in estonia and it's very distinct from you know the noise of urban environment such a, and I do it deliberately in a sense because I feel like your environment is going to reflect your personal psychology a lot as well especially like the mental activity Certainly. so if you are like that's why the big cities are somewhat hyperactive and people are more stressed out in the city because not only like because of the environmental pollution etc but just you know yeah caught up in the pace of life so you are 23 and I understand that your dream is not really to move to a city like many other uh, people living in Estonia young right. young guys like you they probably think of moving out of Estonia to a big city in New yeah. York maybe or or Paris or London and and you know strike it big uh, maybe <laughs> in Silicon Valley in a tech industry yeah. but you want to live on a freaking island <laughs> well I think I think so yeah that's that's gonna be pretty big like I'm already living at a, at a spot where I would imagine that most people would want to end up in the future like if they try to settle down for a family or if they're just if they have achieved a lot of you know great things in their business or in the personal productivity success then that would that would be something that all people would kind of gravitate towards in some aspects like just kind of a peaceful blissful uh, living right sure well um you have written a few books about metabolic autophagy and um maybe if you could give a quick uh description about uh autophagy and mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's related to ketogenic diet. It's related to the way how our, uh, our body is uh, recycling damaged cells. And there's many benefits to this. Uh, before we move into metabolic flexibility, mm. like how you can hi have higher performance, more energy and optimal health, which is going to be the topic today. So if you dive us deep, you know, um, briefly into uh, the processes that also gave the title for your book. Right. Well, if you look at the title, then uh, the kind of two components are metabolic and autophagy. And uh, metabolic refers to just the metabolism, which is kind of the life-sustaining processes that your body goes through uh, for creating energy and surviving, in a sense, converting uh, you know the calories from your food into energy and using it to repair your tissue and just uh, replicate your cells, etc. But the process of autophagy is almost... It's, it's a part of the metabolic processes, uh, but it translates into self-eating uh, or eating of self. And uh, this usually it happens during these periods where your body is actually deprived of the nutrients that it has access to and is undergoing like energy stress and energy deprivation. Mm -hmm. So it's a, like almost like a survival mechanism, me mechanism that 
enables the body to recycle some of the old and worn out cell components. So the body is going after uh, the stuff that doesn't function very mm. well anymore. Yeah, so exactly. Basically, suddenly it has a brief moment where it doesn't have abundance of carbohydrates or whatever food sources for energy, yeah. but it needs to start eating itself out. So instead of eating the healthy tissues and cells, it goes after the damaged ones. That's kind of, I, I exactly. guess, kind of the yeah, point. Yeah, that, that's, that's the point, yeah. And, and uh, in, in, in some aspects, there is some autophagy happening almost all the time in like there's different types of autophagy, different degrees in different tissues, etc. But the point is that during like this more demanding situations, more uh, depriving situations where your body is actually under real stress, then it will go into like a deeper state of autophagy that uh, has like many other benefits, such as like uh, reduced inflammation, fights oxidative stress, uh, helps to clear out all the waste material, and even it's even uh, seen that the the process of autophagy in the brain is used or is it's effective for. Uh, preventing the accumulation of plaque, which is associated with Alzheimer's. Mm. There's also a thing that uh, insulin resistance in some aspects is caused by deficient autophagy and even uh, heart heart disease as well, like atherosclerosis is caused by deficient autophagy and aging in general is a process of not enough autophagy in some sense. And autophagy is like a central part of those, thi- of, of those uh, many pathways that are related to uh, longevity. Right. So... Things like uh, becoming insulin resistant, cancers, uh, Alzheimer's, where amyloid plague is uh, accumulating in your brain, uh, all of that can be alleviated by putting yourself briefly into an energy mm. crisis. So instead of having yeah. abundance of energy, you go to a state where your body goes like, hmm, oh, there's a cancer cell, I'm going <laughs> to eat that. Uh, yeah. Okay, so there's a damaged cell, I'm going to use that. Um, and you give a brief moment for your uh, metabolism also to to go into more of a recovery mode. I guess yeah. when you pump your system on a constant basis uh, full of um, nutrients and food that increase inflammation and the body is fighting inflammation instead of yeah. uh, recovering from it. So um, uh, it's, 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 in some aspects, yeah. it's, in some aspects, it's almost like uh, bringing your body back to balance and bringing it back to the homeostasis where it's supposed to function best at. So in the modern world, uh, we're kind of exposed to excess amounts of calories, too much food, and too you know too fr- high eating frequency, without enough of the nutritional stress, such as periods of famine and periods of famine, and you know under under nutrition. So uh, in a sense, uh, the autophagy is supposed to kind of make your body function at its optimal, where it's best at in the center, like in the balanced, not mm. not overly fed, but not underly nourished either. Like in, in this, that's where like, most of the benefits are come from. In healthy lifestyle, it seems like the balance is key here. I just had a discussion with Kasper van der Merlen about breeding, how it's important to spend as much time as you spend in sympathetic nervous system activated yeah. state, to spend also in a parasympathetic nervous system activated state. To, to use breeding in a way that uh, is linked to, he described it beautifully, how it's linked to glucose utilization yeah. and uh, uh, how all these different moments uh, uh, play into um, maintaining a steady and balanced homeostasis in the body. So autophagy seems to be one. And uh, I guess one of the kind of key triggers for autophagy is um, dietary mm. intervention. So, it's it's one of one of the one of the few uh, ways of doing it. Like, uh, cert- like I said earlier, like there is some autophagy happening almost all the time. It's just that certain activities will accelerate a process and enable the body go into it faster. In some sense, by depriving your body from energy and putting like higher energetic demands onto your system. And uh, yeah, like dietary strategies is probably the most easily accessible ones because. Uh, the you know nutrition and calories they affect the metabolism directly and they affect certain pathways that regulate autophagy uh, directly as well such as either being fed or being in a faster state so mm. like I said o- being overly fed is more like towards growing and accumulating mass but the other opposite end is like being more catabolic where you're breaking down and that's more the, more towards the end of autophagy and uh, self recycling so with with a diet. You're, if you're eating something that's inevitably going to put you into the fed state and uh, how how far off you're going to go into the anabolic side, that depends on like the macronutrient ratios of the food and how many calories you're eating as well. Uh, wh- whereas if you're fasting, you're not consuming any any calories, 
then that's far off to the catabolic side because you're not eating anything. And that's where your body goes, okay, we're not getting the food, so we therefore have to go uh, inside. Right. So, okay. Um, ketogenic diets, those are big topics and trendy things. Um, in Finland, we just released a, a, a biker's guide to ketosis. Uh, it's coming out, by the way, in English also pretty soon. So follow up um, mm. biohackers handbook, uh, Instagram channel and uh, Facebook and our newsletter. And you will you will know when it comes out. Uh, we put together in uh, in one book um, kind of the top level research when it comes to ketogenic diets. Now, uh, why is keto such a trendy thing now and <laughs> uh, how it's linked to autophagy and um, why should people who are looking in to getting more of that cell recycling benefits and maybe getting into metabolic flexibility, mm -hmm. uh, pay attention to high fat, um, uh, low carb diets, which are high in fiber and right. uh, micronutrients. Well, to start off, I would say that, you know, the reason why people would want to uh, go out of their way to actually try to promote more autophagy in their life is that we're not experiencing, you know, those periods of uh, famine anymore, <laughs> and mm. it's very, it's very common for people in the Western world to never f experience the feeling of hunger and the, to never actually go through periods where they're actually going into like a deeper state of fasting and autophagy. So I think just as again, like implementing, you know, certain strategies in regards to nutrition and uh, intermittent fasting into your life is almost like a, you know, a routine. You create a routine and you use that routine to gain those benefits that you wouldn't otherwise get. So, uh, you know, the best kind of uh, way in, in regards to nutrition, the best way to promote autophagy is to just fast and uh, not eat anything. Uh, but there are also certain like macronutrients and certain uh, foods that can also affect this process, or at least they're going to determine how well your body is going to enable to go into autophagy and how flexible your body is in uh, burning different fuel sources. So uh, a ketogenic diet in itself mimics some of the physio physiology of fasting, such as like it's going to suppress your insulin, uh, you're keeping your blood sugar more stable, and you're producing ketone bodies, which are uh, you know energy molecules derived from your own body fat. And uh, that just mimics some of the aspects of, of uh, fasting. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also elevates this fuel sensor called AMPK, which is a fat burning fuel sensor, essentially, or a catabolic fuel sensor that, uh, you know, promotes all these things uh, related, related to self recycling. Uh, with a, and with a ketogenic diet, you're just, yeah, like in, in some aspects, you're also just incorporating some, uh, some, the, some of the ideas of hunter gatherer living as well. Like hunter gatherers, they didn't actually mm -hmm. consume a whole bunch of carbs all the time. And they definitely they didn't eat breads and pastries on a daily basis so so uh, th that's that's the idea of, of combining some aspects of uh, of a ketogenic diet at least in a cyclical manner and with intermittent fasting you're kind of just teaching your body to uh, use these pathways that you don't get in the standard way of living or in and in the standard uh, diet right right so okay so you're mimicking uh, some aspects of fasting but it's not exactly the same thing as fasting mm. uh, you are activating some things that are beneficial um, for recycling your cells and and, and uh, putting your body into more of a mo more of a mode of recovery right. and uh, so um, tell us a little bit about like um, uh, your own experience of of doing this so autophagy might be contributing to and is based on science contributing to longevity. Mm -hmm. You won't be necessarily being able to feel that. Um, I mean, <laughs> yeah. you age, uh, and it's it's a much yeah. longer process. But uh, what is the daily subjectively felt benefits of um, of implementing all the strategies that uh, lead to uh, upregulating um, autophagy? Uh, well, I think that a lot of a lot of people who are doing, let's say, some form of intermittent fasting, then the the immediate benefits they may notice is just uh, like mental clarity, uh, which is partly due to the keto ketogenic metabolism and uh, using ketones as an alternative for the brain. Uh, but at the same time, there's also like, you know, you, you pr probably the, one of the, you know the reasons people do intermittent fasting is for fat loss 
or autophagy and you know slash longevity. So uh, you will be probably able to lose it, lose some weight with it as well, as long as you just uh, practice a, a calorie deficit at the same time. So it makes easier to adhere to a calorie deficit for some people, just because like if you confine your eating window into certain hours then uh, it's going to be harder for you to overeat. You have less time to screw things up in, in a sense that if you eat your calories only within, let's say, uh, you know, six to four hours, for, for example, then uh, you can only fit like maybe two, uh, three, uh, two meals at best uh, versus if you were to graze throughout the entire day, then you can have like more opportunities to eat. And, you know, that's just going to add up all to the uh, daily caloric intake. Uh, that's, that's one of the ways it can be used for fat loss, but there's also mm -hmm. like uh, unique metabolic effects to time restricted eating and intermittent fasting that you don't besides just uh, fat loss, such as like, um, you know, it's, it, it also affects, it has epigenetic effects uh, and activates certain things like sirtuin genes mm -hmm. and uh, FOXO proteins, which are also- Oh, wait, wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> tell us what, why, why should I activate FOXO, FOXO3? Why should I activate sirtuins? Right. Well, f yeah, for FOXO proteins are these uh, longevity-related proteins that get activated under, um, you know, energy stress as well, and they enable the body to adapt to stress, environmental stressors much better, such as the cold, heat, uh, nutritional stressors, and uh, in a sense, they also kind of promote indirectly they pr promote uh, autophagy, not directly, but indirectly in the same manner by just depleting the body from energy. And sirtuins are also another another like very very popular longevity genes uh, that uh, seem to increase lifespan by, again, suppressing some of the anabolic pathways and keeping the body more towards, uh, you know, the catabolic side where it's using, where it's not, it's not causing like excess inflammation from excess energy. It's br brings back, brings the body back towards like homeostasis. Yeah. So when I uh, increase my intake of protein, carbohydrates, I go to the gym, I'm, I'm working out like mm -hmm. crazy, I activate uh, IGF-1, for mm -hmm. example, uh, uh, more of the anabolic side of things. So for growth, I get some muscle and muscle mass and all that. We often think that people who are like uh, super pumped, that they're super healthy. Uh, would you agree on this? Well, it's, it's, it's like a very context dependent, like like it is true a lot true that more more muscle mass and a healthier like or leaner body composition is very correlated with longevity and general health like uh, a lot of people who are fit uh, physically they are healthier because they have less body fat they have less uh, vi visceral fat especially and they have more muscle mass which is a good thing for longevity because muscle muscle is more almost like a it's a, like an equalizer, a complete equalizer in terms of you can, yeah. you can get away with a lot more calories, you're more insulin sensitive, your body can metabolize glucose and the carbs a lot better. You won't go into like these, uh, you know, very inflammatory states because your body is very capable of metabolizing the fuel that you eat. Mm. And definitely someone who doesn't have any muscle mass, although they may be leaner, in some aspects, or they may have like lower body fat, it doesn't mean that they're healthier because they don't have the muscle mass, which would equalize uh, all those effects in terms of uh, being able to metabolize different fuel sources. So generally, slightly more muscle is better, but only to a certain extent. Like if you start pushing it beyond your body's natural capacity, or if you're just using, I don't know, certain other agents that make you more anabolic, then that can just not be ideal. Uh, you know, again, like I would say that, uh, you know, the far extremes are the, the kind of the worst, like huge bodybuilder is probably not the best for longevity and mm -hmm. a very skinny, skinny, frail guy is probably not the best for longevity either. So you want to, again, see some more balance in the middle right. of uh, having enough muscle mass, but not mm -hmm. being uh, deficient either. Yeah, Peter Atia, um, a doctor from the US who is kind of specializing in many of these topics, is also, also talking about uh, the fact that when you have enough lean um, uh, muscle mass, you are less likely to get diabetes because yeah. you have much more places to dump all that excess, car exactly. <laughs> uh, excess carbohydrates. So actually the insulin resistance uh, in cells starts to show up, the damage starts to show up in large muscles first. Yeah. Uh, so if you don't want to hit your organs, you build first, you, you want to build some lean muscle mass. Exactly. Not, and, yeah. you know, like all of the diseases, most of the modern diseases are caused by excess energy on the body. 
And what is excess energy is very context dependent to the individual. So, so you know, like you said, more muscle, the more, more muscle mass you have, the more energy you can dump into your system without causing damage versus someone who is very like a smaller frame uh, or they have like a very slow meta metabolic rate, then the room for error for them is also much low, s smaller because right. they don't have the muscle mass that would equalize those effects. So that, that would be one way to build flexibility is to have some muscle mass. Uh, exactly. And, you know, resistance yeah. training, which is the, the way you build muscle, uh, that's also like a very good, you know, activity to facilitate those benefits. Yeah. What, what do you think about cardio? So I guess like running too much like marathons and triathlon is also <laughs> kind of damaging and not doing it at all is not good yeah. either. So I know you're a big proponent of um, resistance training, um, but uh, what is your take on, uh, on, on, on just going for a run? I think cardio is great, uh, but you know, the cardio, it, it, it does benefit, it's, it seems to benefit a lot of like cardiovascular fitness and aerobic fitness, which is great for, uh, in some aspects, it promotes uh, heart health and blood flow. Uh, but at the same time, people who are doing a bunch of cardio, they're not, they're, they may not be necessarily the healthiest either because of doing the wrong type of cardio or doing it too much. So it's easy to really, um, you know, overdo it and cause excess stress on your body. And at the same time, I think that Cardio, the adaptations you get from cardio, they aren't long term in a sense that you, you can go run a few miles, you can burn like a few hundred calories doing that, but uh, your body doesn't really change other than the aerobic fitness versus if you were to lift weights for like an hour or two uh, and then afterwards your body would get stronger and build muscle, then that muscle, the, that added muscle will also increase your metabolic flexibility mm. and it would increase uh, your insulin sensitivity in the long term because you have now more muscle in the future versus in the adaptations you get from the cardio that, that wouldn't be like that uh, long term you would only adapt to the to the extent of okay i burned that many calories during the cardio period and uh, whether or not you're going to you know your body will get better at aerobics but you wouldn't gain those increased insulin sensitivity like weeks upon weeks afterwards where uh -huh. whereas having that muscle makes you more ins insulin sensitive you know weeks down the line and several months afterwards because you have that extra muscle mm. if we jump into metabolic flexibility it's often uh, thrown around as a term that enables you to use uh, two different fuel sources mm -hmm. uh, simultaneously and easily switch between the two so basically uh, glucose from carbohydrates and uh, ketone bodies from fat now mm -hmm. Um, in my understanding, you need first to adapt uh, mm -hmm. your body to be able to utilize fats as a fuel source yeah. before you can get into this flexible state. So can you kind of dive us yeah. a little bit deeper into that? Yeah, sure. Like, well, like I said, metabolic flexibility is, you know, described to be able to use different fuel sources based upon what's, what the body needs and what kind of fuel is actually in the system at that particular moment. And uh, yeah, generally I would say that, you know, the problem in the modern world is that people are burning carbs all the time and glucose, they're very glucose dependent. And that's also one of the reasons why, you know, people eat so frequently, they need to keep their energy levels high. Their body is dependent of glucose in a certain extent. But, but the problem is that the body can only store a certain amount of glucose in, this, in, the, in the body. Uh, because y it can be stored only as glycogen, and generally it's about 2,000 calories. How about fatty liver? <laughs> well, I'm not sure how easily it's going to be to use fat uh, from the liver, but it's going to take a longer time to heal that condition. But, yeah. the, but the, 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 the idea is that uh, if you're just burning carbs and glucose all the time, then you're not really flexible because you're dependent of the carbs and you're dependent of meal timing constantly. So whenever you're, you, you get low, you're, you, yeah, you haven't eaten in a few hours, your blood sugar drops, you experience an energy crash, your brain, you get brain fog, etc. But you don't get that if, you, if your body would be flexible. Right, yeah. So adapting into a ketogenic um, um, diet and to be able to utilize ketones and also on the brain level so that you don't get like a uh, low energy um, and all that, so that you're able to tap into that fuel source. Now, people report some side effects of that, mm -hmm. like for example, irritation, nervousness, uh, uh, maybe maybe some uh, 
um, headaches even or flu type of symptoms right. um, and all of that. Um, are, are those things that um, some individuals just can't adapt to it because of genetic reasons or, or some other reasons? Or is that everyone can do this? And when everyone does it, can they somehow avoid some of the at, at least early uh, symptoms of mm. adaptation? Well, generally, like every every like human should be able to burn fat and uh, be or go into ketosis because it's almost like part and parcel to our evolutionary biology and uh, like even babies when they're born they're actually mm -hmm. in ketosis and they need ketosis to survive those you know initial periods and you know you know the one of the reasons why people may not be able to go into ketosis or get over this kind of barrier is this uh, withdrawal symptoms from the carbs so uh, mm. it's it's inevitable that if you're used to eating a bunch of carbs uh, very frequently, then it's going to take like a short period of time where you do experience mild, you know, these withdrawal symptoms and energy cr crises. And the way you overcome that is just, you know, there were several ways of going about it, but getting a burger, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, fixing that sugar craving, that, that's not going to be helpful in the long term, but. You can definitely speed up the process with things like intermittent fasting, maybe going for like a longer fast even because fasting kind of forces ketosis and forces your body to start using the body fat. And uh, even like exercise or like cardio is a good example of actually being able to burn through the glycogen, liver glycogen, and then going and, and starting to produce ketone bodies more efficiently. So that's an example of that. Mm -hmm. But even like increasing your salt intake and other electrolytes, that's a, that's a great way to... Uh, avoid some of the symptoms of the keto flu because uh, your your body may you know lose some of its electrolytes if you're if you're in a low carb low carb ketogenic, ketogenic state with uh, which is characterized yeah. by lower insulin as well. So keto doesn't go very well with uh, low salt intake, yeah. for example. So people are afraid sometimes because of uh, salt because of high blood pressure. But if you go for a ketogenic diet, you shouldn't be that afraid of salt because. Yeah the body just works differently than in a, in a yeah well a carbohydrate if you're eating system. if you're eating carbs then your body also retains more water because of the higher levels of insulin but if you don't eat the carbs then uh, your body releases less insulin and in so doing the kidneys hold onto less water and uh, you tend to you know lose some of the electrolytes if you don't replace them with uh, supplementation or adding some salt and gotcha. eating some foods. Yeah, let's check, you know, our, our live stream here. Is anyone here? If, if someone has a question, you know, just, uh, you know, post here. And we are happy to ask our, our, our guest here. Oh, there's a lot of people here coming <laughs> in and out. So, um, yeah, if you have any questions to see him, like, uh, he's ready. Ready for your questions. Yeah, also. that's good. Also, so um, anyway, um, I have a question. Um, uh, uh, when it comes to, you know, you, you wrote a book, Metabolic Autophagy Cookbook. Mm. How would this be different from something like uh, a keto diet book? Mm. Or, or yeah, that's a good point. And uh, in a sense, like, the, the, I think the purpose of the keto diet for most people isn't to be in strict ketosis. You know, like I said, they're probably doing it for fat loss, mental clarity, just adherence and, you know, increased satiety. So, you know, the ketogenic diet originally was invented for epileptic children and they needed to stay in ketosis without fasting to kind of mimic the fasting physiology while still eating and being able to nourish themselves. So most people, they, they don't have those reasons. They don't have like, you know, huge cancer or epilepsy or some other very severe insulin resistance. And they're still just doing keto for fun almost and because of it uh, suits their lifestyle. And in that sense, in that case, you don't need to be in strict therapeutic ketosis all the time either. You, mm -hmm. What you want instead is keto adaptation. So keto adaptation is slightly different from the state of ketosis. Uh, the state of ketosis is more characterized by the amount of uh, ketones in your bloodstream and the energy molecules that your body uses. Uh, Whereas keto adaptation is more like related to the ability to use fat and ketones as a fuel source. Right. So it's like being able to just tap into your fat stores and without, without having to suffer through the ad adaptation phase and without suffering keto flu. So in a sense, keto adaptation is, is a form of metabolic flexibility that, you, that your body has gone through. Yeah. And then you're more flexible afterwards being able ah. to swap between different fuel sources because gotcha. I think that it's not that sustainable to be and you know it's not necessary to be eating keto all the time 
to maintain the benefits of keto adaptation, especially for ladies, I've understood. Yeah, well, in, in in I've I've also like seen some um, interesting things that uh, in terms of females who just seem to do better with a bit of more carbs during some periods of the year, for instance, like hmm. uh, during the menstrual cycles or such. But and if they if they go low carb too long, then that puts uh, you know, like excessive stress on their system. Yeah, sometimes periods go away and bunch yeah. of other crazy. Great yeah, and you know, you, like even even for men, like chronic ketosis all the time may not be ideal because of it may it may downregulate like thyroid functioning a little bit, and it may keep uh-huh. the it may keep the body in this constant state of energy deprivation because in nature there isn't no keto diet. <laughs> in nature, there's o- only fasting and uh, then just scraping for some food, uh, which yeah. which keeps the body in a state of ketosis and keto adapted. Right. So um, if um. If people want to, you know, start start doing some of these things, like what's your advice? Like, should they, you know, go for keto uh, for a while, and um, once they're uh, beyond that phase, they they can go into more cyclical ketogenic mm. diet. And is that more related to auto- metabolic autophagy then? Yeah, I th- I think like it depends a lot on the goals and the particular individual. Like, of course, if someone has diabetes. Of course, if someone is like slightly insulin resistant or they're trying mm. to fix some of their metabolic issues, then I wouldn't recommend uh, really going for you know carbs or eating something like that. For them, it's going to be more on the side of okay, I have to stay in ketosis more often because my body needs to heal itself. Unless you're uh, fully diagnosed diabetic and you 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 can uh, uh, get some serious tr- yeah. health. Tre- uh, I mean, how how likely it is? I mean, we are not giving any, any medical <laughs> advice here, right? Sure. We are not doctors. We are just some fools here in studio live streaming who've been uh, reading a lot of stuff on the internet and uh, <laughs> research papers. So, if you have, if you are diagnosed that you are di- diabetic and um, your pancreas is not able to produce mm. insulin, um, and you plan to go on a ketogenic diet. Um, I've read that those people can probably lower their insulin um, injections mm-hmm. um, because they don't need that much insulin yeah. then. So, so that's one way to kind of lower um, uh, some of the cost also of, uh, of sure. medication in that case. But you shouldn't yeah. necessarily stop your medication <laughs> on a keto diet. Although, uh, I mean, if you go on a, uh, if you are on strict supervision by a doctor. Uh, you might be able to to use that, especially in the pre-diabetic phase, to to really help your body to heal and mm. and, and get back to back to normal yeah. um, glucose metabolism. Yeah, I think mm. it's it's all, all also like depends on like how fast do you want to get well. Like you can actually accelerate the healing process by going for like longer fasts because nothing nothing uh, treats. In my opinion, like nothing treats better the, the glucose regulation and high blood glucose than just fasting. Yeah. Because excess blood glucose indicates excess sugar in the bloodstream. Mm-hmm. So if you burn through that glucose with fasting and not eating anything, then you you will you will be probably able to lower yeah. the lower the glucose better, and then the autophagy process can also heal the pancreas and uh, enable you make you more insulin sensitive again in the future. Oh, super! So, so how, how, what is the longest fast you've done like for autophagy? <laughs> Well, I'm, the longest I've done is like seven days, wow. like weekly, weekly thing. But uh, I haven't, I haven't done it in a few years, and at the moment I'm just focusing maybe on like a few of these three, three, three day fasts uh, a few times a year. And, and I think that more isn't necessarily better. Like if you don't have any like yeah. serious condition, then there's not going to be any reason to go any longer. And when it comes to autophagy then there's also like a point of diminishing returns like you're not going to gain significantly more autophagy after day five in and and I see. like you, if you fast for 10 days then you're probably not going to get like a huge so there difference. might be a little bit more stress on your organs yeah and all that so it's so it's, a, it's a matter of you know longer fasts are great but more frequent fasts that are slightly shorter are better because you you're able to punctuate it more frequently in a sense gotcha. Com- you know imagine if you fast only for seven days once a year you're gonna get only seven days of fasting for that year, but if you do three day fasts, uh, you know every month, then you're gonna get like, you know, fifteen fasts or fifteen days of fasting, etc. Or you know, and yeah. the frequency is actually much better and consistency, because mm. the longer fasts you do the longer fasts, but they put also more stress on the body, especially in terms of catabolism and maintaining muscle mass, 
and they're harder to recover from whereas versus you know a two day fast 48 hour fasts it's not going to affect you it's not going to affect your muscle mass almost at all and right. you're going to able to bounce back from it really quick and you can even do like 48 hour fasts eat for one day and go back for another 48 hour fast because it's not that stressful but you do still gain some of the benefits of the fast state and you go into like a deeper autology as well okay so um I have a question that is related to um, to to uh, this uh, this lifestyle that you you gone into. Now you've done these long fasts, and um, um, what have you learned while while doing those things? Like uh, personally, mm. like have you written all these books while you're in a fasted <laughs> state? Suddenly, you have a lot of more yeah. time. Or, well, that's uh, I think it's one of my secrets. <laughs> is the fasting you know fasting very frequently and intermittent fasting daily so uh first of all there is this just increased productivity in terms of not having to be thinking about food and in terms of just uh you know not being focused on calories and so on just being focusing on the things that I actually need to do and of course i think there is maybe the aspect of increased ketosis which also promotes brain activity and uh, I feel very focused and mentally clear during the fast state. So in a sense, it's it's a combination of uh, like a like the increased brain power on a pre- physical level, but at the same time also the mental discipline and mental consistency in a sense. Because at first it may be somewhat more difficult for someone to actually start to do all these fasting fasting things for sure is because they haven't you know conditioned their body to be able to handle it but after it you know and you know the initial adaptation period does require more discipline and consistency so in a sense it's a it's a great way of like abstaining from things which which is like very correlative to other aspects of your life as well if you're able to stick to a diet then you're able to be you 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 will be more likely to stick to your uh, you know goals and uh, your other routines and habits much better because you know it's neuroplasticity almost like your brain adapts to what you do and if you if you're very you know you fall off the rails all the time you give in to temptations uh, or you procrastinate on purpose then those things they will you know rub off onto other areas of the life you're gonna slack off in uh, your relationship you're gonna slack off in uh, your business or whatever it is so your brain doesn't really tell the difference mm. there is a question on facebook christian is asking what are your favorite supplements for keto and intermittent fasting so uh, i guess you can mm. just survive nicely with just food alone but if yeah. you if you went for some supplements what would you use and what do you think about these so-called keto supplements like ex- exogenous mm. ketones and all that right. like can you cheat <laughs> yeah well i, I would th- say that well, first of all, like nothing replaces a poor diet. No supplement is gonna fix like a poor diet. If you are if you are deficient in certain like the essential nutrients, then you have to first fix the diet and uh, make sure that you know you 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 eat the right foods for that. Uh, in general, like there are still some supplements that I think will would be very beneficial uh, for both ketosis and fasting. And I think a lot of people are deficient in things like vitamin D and magnesium, which are the most probably the most common deficiencies and using some supplements f- to fix that can be useful but again you have to still focus on the lifestyle change like if you're not getting enough vitamin if you're vitamin D deficient then it's mm. probably a sign of you're not getting enough sunlight and uh, that's the best the most bioavailable form of getting uh, vit- vitamin D uh, then maybe I would also like quote-unquote actual supplements that you wouldn't get from food would be some some form of like a digestive enzyme like uh, even for people who don't have any digestive problems, I feel like digestive enzymes can be somewhat useful for uh, clearing out the bloodstream from excess energy mm. and in so doing, go, go, like promoting autophagy as well because autophagy is regulated by the amount of energy in your bloodstream and digestive enzymes are these, uh, you know, enzymes that help to break down the nutrients and uh, the food particles. So you would digest your food better you would have less undigested food particles and you would essentially digest the food faster as well. So I see. Yeah. Using, using some form of digestive enzymes, like that's what I'm doing at the moment. Recently, I've been experimenting with some uh, digestive enzymes and uh, I see, I noticed that, okay, I, I feel that the food is digested much faster, even if it's like healthy food and uh, just, you know, 
I've, I, in, I, my, my own rationale is that that also enables the body to go into autophagy uh, faster. Right. So, uh, yeah, there's there's a bunch of discussion also on your YouTube channel. I'm, I'm checking out what's going on there. Um, yeah, some people, there's someone who said they got some food allergies of doing three-day fast, like allergic reaction to almonds and avocado. Mm. Now, did they just eat away their gut lining or, <laughs> or did they snack on almonds and avocado thinking that they are on a fast or what's going on? Uh, well, food allergies may be... I think they may be caused, yes, in by like intestinal impermeability in some aspects. Mm -hmm. And uh, w during a fast, it is true that you uh, your intestinal imp like intestinal lining may thinner thinen a little bit just because you're not eating and uh, you're like slightly acidic because of like uh, not eating the food. So uh, in some sense, I wouldn't like recommend breaking the fast with like these slightly al allergenic foods such as almonds or even like even like uh, raw eggs can cause some problems for people if yeah. they break a fast with it. So mm. I, I like uh, maybe like breaking a fast with something that uh, stimulates the digestion, but mm. it still like promotes gut healing, like a bone broth. That's that's my favorite way of uh, breaking a yeah, fast yeah. because it's gonna start to repair the gut lining and it makes the body more resilient against all the foods that you right. will eat afterwards. Yeah, some collagen also throwing in there, maybe some glycine yeah. for gut repair. Now. Yeah, if someone has some question like uh, on, on Seam's uh, YouTube channel, that's also possible. But um, yeah, I, I have one one question about like, um, are there any like specific supplement brands that you go for? Like, you know, doing all these things like? Uh, generally, like, n no, not really. Like there isn't a specific brand that has like everything that you need. I think like there's, you, you would probably have to combine certain like different brands and uh yeah i i i don't have like a huge you know uh bias or something mm. <laughs> i gotcha okay good awesome um so uh what do you think about time restricted eating so would you, would that uh like uh, amplify metabolic autophagy by avoiding eating after sunset mm. uh yeah like uh, definitely like time restricted eating is a form of intermittent fasting like uh, when po most people refer to intermittent fasting, then they're actually talking about time restricted eating. Uh, but um, during the actual fasting phase, that's where your body is facilitating autophagy, which actually most of the autophagy process occurs during sleep, so to say. So what you do during the day, that's going to prepare the body for the rep repair processes that are going to take effect during sleep. And uh, that's where you're doing sleep. Your body also uh, raises growth hormone and uh, increases melatonin levels as well. So me melatonin, melatonin is an important hormone for modulating a lot of the repair processes, such as growth hormone as well as autophagy. So if your sleep quality sucks, then you're not getting the most bang for your buck when it comes to autophagy. So you would probably have to focus a lot more on optimizing your sleep before you're thinking that you're extending your lifespan <laughs> with fasting and such, because uh, the sleep is probably more important. With that being said, uh, things like eating too late in the evening can, in, in some aspects, inhibit that process a little bit, because mm. if you have like a lot of food in your system uh, when you're about to go to bed, then your body just has to b burn through those calories first before it can start repairing itself. You yeah. know, and, it's and, and there's also the whole process of uh, how melatonin influences yeah, exactly. uh, pan pancreas and insulin release. So melatonin uh, secretion blocks insulin release, and, and then you get um, you know uh, increased risk for uh, insulin resistance right. building up. So yeah, That's true. but I think it's yeah. it's a matter of again context. If if uh, if a person is not doing any time restricted eating, they're eating three square meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then like an late night snack, then that's the worst situation because you're you're staying in the fed state all the time. Versus versus someone who is doing like uh, they maybe eat only like lunch and dinner or just dinner or something, then they're still fasting most of the day. And for them, that's not going to be that big of an issue because their body is already so insulin sensitive and uh, that's not going to be that affected that much. Of course, you know, I, I don't really think it's a good idea to be eating when it's dark outside or like immediately before going to bed, you still want to have like this buffer zone at least a few hours before uh, when you stop eating before going to bed. So uh, yeah, like there's there's these many aspects that uh, affect this. But generally, I, I think 
uh, waiting for maybe two to four hours at minimum is the kind of minimum dose before you want to stop eating before going to bed. Okay, gotcha. So, so yeah, I mean, there are some routines. Um, we have to let our uh, video guy go soon. Um, <laughs> and, and for that reason, we are coming to the end of this. I've been live streaming for three hours now. This is this, uh, awesome. putting a tax on my <laughs> fasting. So I'm, I'm, hung, I'm hungry, actually. So um, my question to you is regarding Biohacker Summit that's coming on the 1st and 2nd of November in Helsinki, Finland. So check out biohacker.to slash 2019 or just biohackersummit.com. Check out. Uh, you can still sign up. Uh, in July, you get cheap, dis- cheap discount and cheap tickets uh, to to get access to uh, the best conference we have put together so mm. far. It's coming really nicely together. CM is going to be there. Yeah, one, of of the, one of the keynotes. Um, actually, kind of uh, launching some books and stuff, you know, first time in a conference. So um, you have one of the morning keynotes, actually, I think. So um, what are you going to be sharing there? Why should people come to Biker Summit? You came to one of mm. our events in, I think, 2016. Yeah. First. And that was the first uh, one, yeah. yeah, you've been coming back uh, on a regular basis and you helped also to organize the, the Tallinn Biker Summit. Now, uh, what should people expect if they come? Well, I think, first of all, you know, like you said, it's, it's, I think, in my opinion, it's the best or the top uh, biohacking conferences in the world because you literally bring together these experts and uh, people in the various fields uh, in the field of health optimization and biohacking. So I think, yeah, for most people, that's going to be a really knowledgeable experience as, and uh, like even just the mere fact of being around these smart people is going to help you to incorporate some of the same principles that they follow into your life like you're just gonna go home very motivated and you're gonna you know make new friends like the first time i went to i'm like i'm still con- contacted with the people that i'm that i uh th- that i met at the first bike or summit i went That's to right. so yeah. it's definitely and you know the one of the reasons we're working together as well is because we we uh i, I went there and we i i, I made this video mm. an after movie about the event so it was a really fun experience so i didn't do it like for for uh, publicity or something, I just did it because I wanted to share some of the experiences that I had. Yeah, that was really and it's, great. Yeah, and it was like a really awesome event. So w- one of the differences, what makes Biohacker Summit different from other events is also that the community aspect and uh, like the expo area, there's there's the speakers, there's also the expo area where like all the different gadgets, technology. So yeah, it's a very, you know, mm. wide range of experiences people can experience. And of course, the, the sauna and this ice bath, and, spy, yes. yeah, it's, it's it's a lot of fun. So yeah, people are definitely anyone who wants who's never been to Finland, then they, they should definitely yeah, try to yeah, come if here. you want to discover the roots and origin of uh, sweat uh, <laughs> bathing and <laughs> sauna, like that's the best place for it. And if you've been struggling to find the others, the the other people who are uh, your tribe, I mean that's the place for sure. Make lo- long time friends, and you don't know where you end up after that. Maybe doing some crazy breathing yeah. exercises <laughs> with one of the top Wim Hof method uh, experts, um, etc. So yeah, you all m- most welcome. Um, and uh, Seem is going to be talking about metabolic flexibility there, mm. and uh, he's going to give the best keynote so far uh, he has ever. Uh, done on the sure. topic sure. and uh, yeah yeah and we also launched the biker's handbook there uh first time kind of in a, in a, in a physical event so um uh it's gonna be a hell of a party so um yeah looking forward to that and, yeah. and um zim is also helping us with these live shows occasionally uh jumping in uh, there's interviews coming along. Um, uh, we continue again in August um, with Max Lugaver, with Anthony Di Clementi, uh, Molly Malouf. Uh, there's a bunch of great uh, um, people coming live. And uh, yeah, looking forward to those interviews as well. And thank you very much, Seem, for coming to the show and, and making pleasure. the time to, to make it to the Biker Center studios here in Helsinki. Yeah, of course. It's great. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a healthy awesome weekend maybe awesome.